thank you very much for the introduction. I start by showing you one image, an image full of pertinent details. It was drawn by Mats Vanneham, an illustrator and archaeologist at Stockholm County Museum in Sweden. And the image is taken from Vanneham's book, Hitta Historien. It was published in 2010 by Bonnier Carlson, one of Sweden's leading publishers of children's literature. In English, the title of Vanneham's book means as much as finding the history. But it could also be understood as a request to find the history. Now, this image will accompany us throughout this lecture. Vanneham's work consists for the most part of 10 large images in this book. And each one of them stresses, uh, stretches across one full double page. They depict snapshots of Swedish prehistory and history from the Ice Age to the present. The Ice Age, the Mesolithic, the Neolithic, the Bronze Age, the Migration Period, the Viking Age, the Middle Ages, the Age of the Swedish Empire, the Industrial Age, and of course, the present, which is this image. Each image shows the same place from the same vantage point, although at different points in time and with significant historical changes occurring between one image and the next. The scenes depicted are full of detail. You see human beings engaging with one another. You see their buildings, their material possessions, their material remains, as well as a good bit of geology. In the earlier image, you also see a lot of flora and fauna. At the end of the book, Vanneham briefly describes each image, the historic reality it represents, and the archaeological record left behind. And there's also a chronological table. Now, the point of Vanneham's book is that by moving from one image to the next, you can trace every time period's deposits in slowly accumulating and occasionally diminished archaeological layers. Pits, basements, and even batches reach down and destroy older layers as do modern underground tunnels and car parks. Some archaeological artifacts are later rediscovered, while others remain, for now, in their original position. Hitta Historien, Finding the History, allows Vanneham's young readers to observe how each period, in clearly stratified context, leaves its own distinctive material traces on top of those of earlier periods. It is about discerning how each period, including the present, transforms the landscape and builds a new layer of habitation on the existing archaeological record of earlier times. Find the history, exclamation mark, is a more urgent request to the reader, corresponding to what is commonly demanded of professional archaeologists. They are expected to discover the past by recovering and analyzing its material remains. These remains are said to form part of the archaeological record, and to a large extent they are found underground. Archaeologists are obliged to describe and explain the course of human history by studying the archaeological record. This, then, is what the reader of Vanneham's book is expected to do as well. Experience, discover, and become curious about the past. It is almost like being an, a real archaeologist, as the back cover has it. Just do it, find the history. Now, in this view, there's quite clearly only one past, the past that really happened. Archaeologists search in the present for material evidence, which they then study in order to reconstruct that past and that thus right history. Now, if all this seems self-evident, and you're wondering what I'm getting at, let me now tell you that in my view, depicting history, archaeology, heritage, and society in the way I've just described is a mistake. There is no single past waiting to be revealed by the practices of scientific archaeology and history. The material remains of the past do not mean anything themselves. There's no archaeology and no data set independent of culture, society, and its associated practices. The meaning of the past and its remains cannot be revealed objectively, but are always created in a given contemporary social and cultural context. I would like to argue that the objective existence and character of the archaeological record below the surface is not a precondition for archaeology, but in fact the precise opposite. 
the archaeological record as we know it today, is a result and consequence of our way of practicing archaeology. Key notions like the archaeological record, objectivity in recording, classification of artifacts and periods, and the stratigraphic method, ambitions to trace the lives of human individuals of the past, to reconstruct ancient cultures and landscapes in relation to ethnic groups and national heritage, to conserve ancient remains and to educate the public about archaeology and the past. All these notions of practices, all these, uh, all these notions or practices that steer much of contemporary archaeology are in fact neither given nor self-evident. Arguably, if it was not for a particular way of thinking associated with modernity, the entire idea of archaeology as we know it may never have occurred to anybody. Archaeology is a phenomenon of modernity. And the entire past can only be understood from the vantage point of our time. This is why I'm using only one of Benaham's beautiful artworks, the one depicting the present, our own time. I do not want to let readers be seduced by a very evocative but misguided narrative of history and a misconceived notion of an objective and largely timeless archaeological record that is simply waiting to be discovered by a modern archaeology. Now let us concentrate on this one image for a bit longer. And I'd like to draw your attention to some of its details. Here's a rock surface with carvings depicting human beings, an axe and a ship, among other motifs. The information panel was put there by the museum around the corner. It explains that most of the carvings date to the Bronze Age and that archaeologists believe they are connected to ritual practices and Bronze Age cosmology. However, the man reading the sign while his dog is engaged in other business knows that there are archaeologists who have other views, for he recently took a distance learning course on rock art in Northern Europe. Dating rock carvings is notoriously difficult, and there are a number of competing interpretations as to their meaning and function. Are these carvings part of a hunting magic? Are they ancient graffiti of enterprising youngsters or bored shepherds? Were they carved known and appreciated by the entire community, or were they off-limits for all except the social elite or ritual specialists? Are they expressing territorial claims, not entirely unlike the way the dog marks its territory? The carvings could also depict the totems of various clans which gathered in the neighborhood. Or perhaps they are some kind of symbolic writing telling stories, real or imagined, about daily life or unique adventures. There is no definitive answer, as the man was told in the course. Indeed, he wonders whether rock carvings are enigmatic precisely because they resist our desire to gain certainty about them. They invite us to pause and consider different interpretations. They are a mirror in which we see our own categories and understandings of society reflected back at ourselves. As much as we pose questions about the origins and meaning of rock carvings, they pose questions back at us. Who are you? Which society do you live in? How do you make sense of the world around you? Whose interpretation of us do you trust? The local museum first opened in 1912, and it has, been, it has long been a dusty affair, visited mainly by school children who were dragged there by their teachers. However, in recent years, the local council launched a campaign to reinvent the town as a cultural center for the entire region. Among other measures, they acquired copies of national archaeological treasures for display in the museum, and they also employed an additional archaeologist to write a new guidebook. The council saw to, saw to it that the bus line leading to the zoo has to stop right in front of the museum building. It was hoped that all this would increase the town's attractiveness as a tourist destination and also make the town more attractive for new inhabitants and prevent existing residents from moving away. The council also contracted an advertising agency to come up with a more attractive brand for the town, ideally by linking it to notions of a splendid past and a promising future. In addition, the agency was asked to overhaul the web page for the museum, making it more interactive and featuring an online exhibition. All this work has begun to pay off. Now, Local residents often bring friends and visitors to the museum, proudly showing off their archaeological treasures and local history. 
Several have commented in the visitor's book that they had no idea that a little museum like this one featured an entire mammoth skeleton, and that this alone had been well worth the visit. One nine-year-old wrote that the mammoth may, had made him want to put more effort into his schoolwork so that he would get higher marks and could later become a paleontologist. He did not add that he had gotten this idea originally from his favorite computer game that featured mammoths. Other pupils commented that they had most enjoyed the ice cream in the cafeteria. Last year, there was a huge argument in the town council. Some of the elected members had questions whether it was worth spending the taxpayers' money on the museum's collection of 80,000 artifacts from prehistory, many broken and most likely never to be included in an exhibition. Well, some members objected that they had a responsibility to preserve the local heritage for future generations. Others reminded the assembled politicians of the existing holes in the budget and the promises made during the last election campaign. Were they not supposed to improve daycare facilities, build that new sports hall, and renovate the nursing home? Precisely how much was the museum's prehistoric collection worth to, to the town? In the end, they decided to postpone a vote on this tricky question until after the next election. Incidentally, the curator of the museum's bone collection was recently sent to Asia, where a major fire had destroyed a shopping center in a big city. More than 130 people had lost their lives in the inferno, and forensic experts from several countries have been sent to assist with the kind of work that is carried out in the aftermath of any such catastrophe. Thanks to his osteological skills and experience, the curator had been able to identify a number of individuals from the small burned fragments that were left. In this way, he was able to help a number of anxious relatives whose loved ones were missing and who suspected, but did not know for sure, that there had been among the victims. Thanks to the experts, the relatives had been given that certainty. This is a section drawing by a first year university student who volunteered at the local dig during Easter vacations. His presence turned out to be very valuable. The archeological firm which was awarded the contract for the excavation had been short of staff that week but the work had to be completed before construction of a tunnel for the local underground train station. On the firm's final day, in this particular part of the excavation, the supervisor suddenly realized that one bit of the east-west section had not been documented, even though it had been fully exposed already for several days. So she asked the student whether he could quickly sketch it, approximately from, that, from those concrete foundations in the west to the stones that looked like a fish in the east. The result would be good enough for the report that we're going to write. This was commercial archaeology, after all, not a university research project. Better rough documentation than none at all. The onlookers at street level who observed the archaeologists down in their trenches were fascinated by the picture of archaeologists at work. Both the supervisor and the student were wearing hard hats and safety rests. They were exploring the unknown, revealing and documenting stuff that had been untouched for centuries. What were they going to discover next? A skeleton? A trash of coins? Whatever they found, every little detail contained information that allowed the specialist to piece together the puzzle that would eventually present a picture of past life. But, as in any good mystery, it was not the solution to the case that this audience was waiting to hear. They had stopped to observe the detectives of the past at work, meticulously recording clues and collecting various kinds of evidence in order to reconstruct the past and write a chapter of human history. Since that idea fascinated the onlookers more than anything else, they did not even notice the subtleties of the section being recorded in front of their eyes. Visitors tend to flock to the museum on rainy weekend afternoons, often accompanied by their children. Many visitors take a break in the museum's cafeteria. Imagine if we were mammoth hunters, says the boy enthusiastically to his cousin, who had come along to the museum while he stayed with his aunt and uncle who lived at the outskirts of the town. That would be so cool, then we wouldn't need to go to school every day. His dad, who's just returning with two ice creams and a cup of coffee, smiles. 
you may not have to go to school in prehistory, but you would probably be helping your parents gathering firewood every day, collecting berries, and helping with other chores in the house. There would certainly be days and weeks when you went to bed hungry. How cool is that? At this point, the woman sitting at the table next to them turns around. You know what? I think I would still be ready to swat my time against theirs. I'm bored at my job. I've never had much use for most of what I've learned at school. And I wish this, the children would help more with the chores anyway. They all laugh, imagining for a moment the bliss of being able to solve all these problems at once if they could only be beamed back to a Stone Age reality. Their own lives would be much improved. And given their experiences in 21st century society, they are confident that they might be able to improve Stone Age life quite a bit too. Now, I could go on and discuss further details in Mats Wenneham's image from 2010. And in fact, I have been doing this in the publication of this lecture, which um, is ready now as well. I decided at the outset to focus on just this one drawing. I did not reproduce the other images depicting what the same place looked like in previous time periods. Whoever later inspects Wenneham's book will find that some of the topics and issues I've discussed have references in the other illustrations, but others do not. The point is that the past is never a given. In every present, the entire past and what is taken to remain of it are open to argument and negotiation. In 50 years, Wenneham cannot simply add another image to his series, but he will have to start over from the beginning. Nothing, they say, is more difficult to predict than the past. However, in this lecture, I wanted to, mo wanted to do more than point to the inevitable uncertainty of historical and archaeological research, and the way it is always historically situated and culturally constituted. I have highlighted a number of what I would like to call archaeological and heritage-related situations in the present. Each was significant, not in so far as it exemplified the difference between scientific knowledge and public perception and interpretation, but rather in so far as it exemplified a significant phenomenon of contemporary Geschichtskultur. And I need to explain a little bit what I mean by that. Since the 1980s, German historians with a didactic focus have been developing the concept of Geschichtskultur, which translates into English as culture of history, or somewhat more literally as a society's history culture. As defined by Jörn Rüsen, Geschichtskultur encompasses all socially effective manifestations of an awareness of the past in contemporary society. It is thus an important part of what my German colleagues call Vergangenheitsvergegenwärtigungskultur. <laughs> Let's get rid of that again. Although Geschichtskultur arguably developed over a long time, by now it amounts to a novel relation to the past that has taken hold in society. Geschichtskultur encompasses a wide variety of representations of the past that permeate the boundary between academic and popular engagements and reveal both spheres as interdependent. Its diverse manifestations are not merely derivatives of historical scholarship, but they follow their own logic and possess their own qualities, increasingly influencing academic agendas. Academics can expect their audiences to be well-versed in the various offerings of Geschichtskultur, and they know that this familiarity colors what the public expects of them. The aim of historical learning is consequently broadening from being able to understand and analyze historical processes and events to appreciating also the qualities, the usefulness, and the risks of those pasts that become evident in contemporary Geschichtskultur. Geschichtskultur is characterized by increasing intermediality. Original representations of the past are no longer primarily drawn from scholarly writing, but they may appear as films, as cartoons, games, written fiction, weblogs, guided tours, role playing, site specific performances, full size reconstructions, virtual reality, online archives, and so on. These formats and genres increasingly refer to one another. There are guided tours on the film sets of historical movies. 
There are academic books containing cartoons. There are weblogs about historical role playing. And there are inaugural lectures that are based on children's books. Factual, fictional, and simulated pasts blend together. When historians and archaeologists today are satisfied with producing ever more academic literature and reports in traditional scholarly formats, they're effectively refusing to make use of the many rich forms of expression that can reach and are meaningful to broad contemporary audiences. Geschichtskultur has become a part of everyday life, transcending the academic and political domains where it has long been significant. Today, heritage and the past are literally everywhere. The rich flora of heritage and pastness in contemporary society no longer follows the disciplinary divisions and established academic categories, but it has its own logic. Contemporary Geschichtskultur brings together, among others, social, psychological, religious, commercial, legal, and political aspects of the past. In contemporary Geschichtskultur, the past is thus significant in many ways beyond scholarship and learning. Academic credentials of professional experts are not sufficient to give some stories more authority in contemporary society than others. Archaeology and heritage have acquired novel forms of expression and entered additional realms of everyday life. Contemporary Geschichtskultur is educational and entertaining, abstract and applied, immersing and interactive, all at the same time. I suggest that archaeologists and historians need to relate proactively to these trends and adjust their own activities and objectives accordingly. They need to understand better in what way their subject matter is meaningful in contemporary society. The professionals have a constant need to extend their cultural competence in order to stay connected with living Geschichtskultur, or they risk being seen as superfluous. One way in which archaeology and heritage have become meaningful in contemporary Geschichtskultur is through the stories they tell. Stories about the past allow human beings to make sense not only of the past, but also of their own world in the present. These stories can be mystery or adventure stories about archaeologists making discoveries or investigating remains of the past. Or there can be stories about past events and processes that acquire particular meanings in the present. Crucially, in such stories, it is not the past as such which attracts interest and gains social significance, but rather the broader issues that an engagement with the past raises. What matters most is not so much the scientific accuracy and empirical richness of the story itself, but the extent to which the story draws us as characters into the plot of a story that touches us. Such stories make archaeology and heritage function as media of social practice. They make us reflect upon our actions and motivations, and they influence our behavior in contemporary society. Now today, many archaeologists are concerned about quality issues in contemporary archaeology. I agree with this concern, and I would like to suggest that the most important quality we're talking about is that archaeology and heritage as media of social practice raise many social, cultural, and political issues that are significant to contemporary society. Archaeology and heritage in present-day society can mobilize many social groups and benefit their lives in a variety of ways. I've given a number of specific examples. Many more could be added. An archaeological and heritage-related project should start with a clear vision of how it addresses and advances such questions. Prioritizing the question of what archaeology achieves for society at large has in the Netherlands recently been described as archaeology upside down, or reverse archaeology. Corresponding to reverse engineering, the idea of this initiative, championed by the Dutch archaeological company The Missing Link, is to begin an archaeological project by considering the values for different constituencies of possible outcomes of the project. These values differ between the project's various stakeholders, including state heritage authorities, spatial planners, politicians, professional archaeologists, developers, and consumers. The project is then designed and carried out so as to maximize its benefits for all stakeholders in a cost-efficient way. 
such concern about the value and value for money of archaeology for ordinary citizens, local government, and other stakeholders in present-day society ought to be described as ordinary archaeology rather than reverse archaeology. It is worrying when such ambitions are explicitly criticized by others for selling out the agenda of scientific archaeology. An agenda that is exclusively dedicated to gaining academic knowledge that wants to decide alone what is and is not important for everybody about archaeological heritage and does not wish to consider various other interests of living people is all too limited. The very idea of Geschichtskultur suggests that academic archaeology is not separated from society. Archaeology does not study the past from a specially protected vantage point, nor is it solely committed to the advancement of academic knowledge about the past. In addition to the strictly academic values of the scholars engaged in research, non-academic stakeholders and the way in which archaeology and heritage are meaningful and valuable to them need to be taken seriously throughout heritage management and even by professional archaeologists themselves. This is in line with the focus on heritage values that has internationally become prevalent throughout the heritage sector. In Swedish archaeology and heritage management, questions concerning the social value of archaeology and heritage have attracted considerable attention in recent years. Some of my colleagues have recently published impressively sophisticated and innovative discussions of archaeological practices and approaches that bring about clearly defined social benefits. I would like to point out that these advances have emerged directly from projects and a variety of challenges encountered at the sharp end of the Swedish heritage sector. They are accomplished by municipal national, and national heritage authorities, by museums and commercial companies operating in the heritage sector. It is symptomatic, and not only for Sweden, I gather, that the academic world and notably the universities are only now catching up with the major changes that have transformed the heritage sector in recent years. Now, in closing, I wish to note that it should not be considered particularly remarkable that the discipline of archaeology and the heritage sector are being subjected to some of the same processes that apply to other professions and sectors in the 21st century. The demand for accountability, the request to offer concrete benefits to broad groups in society, and the need to offer value for money are all trends that can be observed throughout present day society. Archaeology is not only a particular academic and scientific practice, but more fundamentally it is a cultural and social practice. Archaeology has always been and should always remain a distinctive expression of the culture and the society running it. As such, it will reflect and depend on, what societies, on that society's values and established cultural practices. These values and practices necessarily change over time in the same way that culture at large is constantly changing. That this is occurring again today is not an anomaly of our age, but the way it has been since archaeology first came into being, and indeed the way it should be. So archaeologists may be searching for the past, but in more ways than one, they're finding their own present. Gradually, they keep revealing the many qualities of archaeology and heritage in contemporary society. Thanks very much. <laughs>